Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, we're going to tell you how to automate and scale your data pipelines the cloud native way. Guillaume Moutier from Red Hat will be um, reintroducing himself and telling you a little bit about himself and then um, giving us a bit of a deep dive in our data pipelines um, initiative. So, Guillaume, please take it away, and uh, there will be live Q&A at the end of this. I will get the slides from him and we will post it all on blog.openshift.com and on YouTube, as usual. Take it away, Guillaume. Okay, thank you, Jan. Hi, everyone. I'm Guillaume Moutier. Uh, greetings from Canada. I'm a, set, I'm a technical evangelist at Red Hat in the, the storage business unit, and I'm, uh, I'm working mostly on, uh, on data. Uh, not storage itself, but data, the way you consume it, the way you, you move it around, and uh, especially in, in the AI ML field. Uh, but uh, today we're go we're going to look at a, a pure st standard data pipeline and at the way you can automate it and uh, scale it uh, automatically uh, the, the, the cloud native way. So let's get started. Um, First, the cloud native. Uh, to, set the, to set the stage, I want you to, to go back a little bit on what uh, on what the, the characteristics can be for a, a cloud native platform. Uh, here, uh, I'm listing the things that are most important for me. But what you must never forget is why you are doing things. Here is the business outcomes. What are we trying to achieve when we are implementing those kind of uh, architectures? For me. Most important things are speed, efficiency, and foremost, adaptability. Uh, we, we know now that uh, technology is moving fast, so real fast, and we have to adapt our businesses, our organizations, to be able to, to handle the, the, this kind of changes. And so uh, adaptability is and was my main concern uh, all throughout my career. And now we have the tools and we have the, uh, the, the technology to be able to, to achieve those uh, this business goals. So let's take a look at uh, uh, what I would call a leg legacy data pipeline architecture. And I call it legacy, but I know for sure that for most organizations, it's still the standard way to, uh, to do things. We look at architectures where that, that are very tightly coupled and not easily scalable. For example, if I take a very basic uh, application where a user will save a file to some storage that can be processed by, uh, by an application, well, the way it works uh, for most applications is that the, there is some storage mounted uh, on a computer, it can be uh, a shared folder or something like that, and then the, 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 the file is sent to the storage. Again, it has to be mounted against the server, CIFS, iSCSI, but still uh, some kind of uh, hard connection in between the storage and the application server, and then it's consumed by an application, let's say some uh, Java application here. Uh, problem is with this architecture, well, first, I have to have things very close from one another because of this mounting problem. I cannot mount a CIFS over thousands of kilometers. doesn't work well. Also, the scalability problem. Uh, when I am using this type of connection, that means that if I want to put up another application server, for example, because I want to scale my, uh, my application uh, capabilities, well, it has to have exactly the same configuration as the, my first server, exactly the same storage connection, exactly the same mount point and behavior. So that's okay if you have one or two servers, but if you have tens or hundreds of them, that's a burden that you have to take care uh, that you have to take care of. Now let's look at a more uh, cloud native way to do this kind of things. Well, we can think of an application again where a user will just send a file, but this time to an object storage. And here it's a fully disconnected mode. You know, using object storage, consuming object storage is only HTTP connection, so it's only a put or a get, and then that's it. Uh, I'm finished. I have no uh, remaining connection in between my uh, user application and the object storage. Same thing for your data processing function. They can consume this storage directly and uh, as they need it. So that means they can be wherever you want and they can scale. It will be much easier to do. And now we have uh, 
intelligent storage, uh, I, I would say. In the, in the latest releases of Ceph, we have now bucket notifications. So that means that whenever something is happening on the object storage, you can send a notification, let's say, to a Kafka bus. That will, it, that will itself trigger some data processing function. Here, I like to put Kafka in the middle of those kind of architectures because it can act in two different ways. First, uh, as a buffer. Let's say my data processing function is not ready or not ready yet. Well, the, the notifications will keep coming in inside the Kafka bus, and when it's ready, then it will be consumed, the topic, the notifications will be consumed, and then the, the, the function can realize its, uh, it, it, its process. But also, uh, Kafka can act as uh, some, uh, some hub for all those notifications. So we can imagine that we have different processing functions, maybe in different places, different data centers, realizing different operations, but everyone feeding on the same, uh, on the same topic. So. We'll try to do it for real. We'll try to build an application that will uh, that will work like this. So here for this demo, I took the example of uh, ACH payments. For uh, for you people who are not in the in the United States, uh, ACH can be seen as some uh, electronic check, electronic payments. So it can be used uh, by a customer paying a service provider, an employer depositing money on your uh, on your checking account uh, for for payrolls. All, all those kind of things happening electronically. For my demo here, I will try to implement this uh, very basic, uh, very basic pipeline where someone buys something from a merchant and there is an elect electronic payment happening. The way it works is that the transaction has to be sent to the uh, to the bank of of the merchant, we, and this bank will produce what is called an ACH file. It's a standard file. We'll come it. Uh, we we'll come to it in a minute. A standard file that will be sent to, to the Federal Reserve. Here it will be processed and make available to the receiving bank. The receiving bank will be uh, the one of the customer, so it will be the one to process the transaction and debit the, the, the account of the, of the customer. Okay, So that's the, 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 the basic process of ACH. And as a reference here uh, is the, uh, the ACH uh, file itself. And the way it works, you know, very uh, old-fashioned way of uh, describing transaction with the first line uh, giving information about uh, the, the, the bank, uh, the bank itself, and uh, some basic information about the company. Second line, more details about the company. And then you have all those transaction fields with the different uh, customers here, the amount of money that they have uh, that, they, uh, that they have spent, and to which bank, to which receiving bank, this transaction should be sent. Okay. This is how I have implemented it inside OpenShift. So I have here uh, some kind of generator, we'll come to it, that generates uh, fake transactions and send, uh, send the, the, those files inside, so inside an uh, object storage bucket. Then this one will trigger a notification that will be sent to a Kafka bus. And here I, have, I will be using Kenative uh, eventing and Kenative serving. That's a way in uh, Kubernetes and in OpenShift to, uh, to uh, create uh, on-demand uh, pods, on-demand function. So I have a service that will be listening for Kafka events and then spinning up a deployment of the container that will process the, 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 the file, that will process the transaction. So here what it will do is create an ACH file for the, for the transactions and send them to the, to the bank, so the bank of the merchant. So here I will have uh, a few buckets. So I do my demo with seven different banks, so seven different buckets uh, uh, to which the different files will be sent depending on the merchant sending, uh, sending the file. At the, the, the origin bank, those files will be processed. Uh, basically, what it will do is look at all the transactions and recreate new ACH files. This time, sending it to uh, to a destination to the destination bank to the receiving bank. All those files will be created and versed into the, into uh, different buckets. So this this time, buckets belong, belonging to the the receiving banks where they will be processed. So 
here the, the standard process will be to look at the transaction and debit the account of the, of the customer. What we will do in this demo is that we'll only look on the amount processed and we will just sum them up in some, in some, <laughs> some, big, uh, uh, some big bucket just to, to see how many transactions were processed and uh, how, many, uh, how much amount of money was, uh, was processed all throughout, uh, all throughout this pipeline. So to implement this, a uh, few things that I need, some uh, Kafka topics to be able to send my notifications. So here you can see at the bottom, I have the, the, the Mercant upload topic and, and uh, the uh, ODFI topic where I will send the file. Then I have some uh, buckets that I have created in my, uh, in my storage. So here are all the buckets that I have. And don't worry, you will have access to the, to, to, to the code and everything to be able to, to reproduce the demo. So I won't go into, uh, into too, too many details uh, on this right now. And then we will uh, program the bucket notifications themselves. How, it done, how it's done in, uh, in, uh, in Ceph, in RHCS, uh, in Red Hat Ceph storage, what you can do, what you do is to create a topic that will point to your Kafka, uh, to your Kafka endpoint. Okay, so here I will create a topic uh, with the name RDFI and I will point it to my Kafka Kafka cluster, okay? And then for each bucket, I will use this reference to the, the topic I, I just created, and I will here, it's a, it's a simple put request uh, to the name of your bucket. Here is from an old demo, so here it's, it should be a different name, and the notification, uh, notification verb, and the configuration of the topic that I want to use in Kafka. Finally, before we go on for a live demo, uh, this is a transaction job. Uh, the, the way it works is that it will trigger a container that will generate our transactions and it will run 60 times with a parallelism of five. So that means that I will be able to create five, five files at a time uh, inside, the, my, uh, inside my cluster, inside my OpenShift cluster. So let's go, let's do this. So here, uh, what we can see here, I am in my project, I can see that I have three pods, which are the pods, uh, the cognitive pods, the serverless, OpenShift serverless pods that are listening to, uh, to events. I have also in my OpenShift serverless, I have three different processes, three different services, uh, which will split the SCH files or process them depending, and they are ready. But you see, those processes are ready, the services are ready, but there are no pods running. So now we are scaled to zero, okay? So let's create this, uh, tr those transactions. Here, I will use that the exact same file I just showed you, and now, it's being put into motion. So here we can see that we have five uh, containers creating uh, based on the, the, the trans transaction uh, image, uh, transaction container that I, uh, that I have designed, and they will begin to create new transactions. And as new transaction files are created, well, it triggers containers, it triggers uh, the ODFI split, that means looking at the ACH files and splitting them and uh, putting them inside the rat bucket. It also triggers RDFI split, that's what's happening when it looks inside the ACH file and uh, splitting them together to send it to the receiving banks. And then the RDFI process, so here I'm processing uh, the, uh, the transactions themselves. It will be better with a live view like this. Here is the Grafana dashboard where I have uh, my pipeline. We can see that we have already generated 15, uh, 15 different transaction files, 16 now. So far, 16 have been processed and dispatched to the different uh, bank of origin. And so far we have treated eight, uh, we have processed eight, uh, eight of them. Those files are are split in uh, for the different receiving banks and they are sent here to uh, to the receiving banks buckets where they are 
processed and so far we have processed 75 of them. Of course, we have many more uh, files in this process because we take each originating file and split them, split each tr transaction towards its, uh, its own receiving bank. We can see as the process is going on that uh, the, the CPU usage is increasing, of course. We are spinning more pods as we, uh, as we need them. We have also the RAM usage uh, going on. And I have some lags here on the deployments, but it should keep up uh, in a few seconds. And we can see here the, the value of the transactions that have been processed so far. So we can see it's going up. We are now at about... Uh, $9 million. Uh, what I generate here for transactions, it's, uh, it's a random number of transactions uh, between 300 and 500 of them for each file. And the amount itself is between $1 and $2,000. Okay, so that's the, the kind of transactions I'm generating. And here we can see the different deployments now that we have. Uh, we are now up to 15 parts. We can see that we have five uh, deployments of the create transaction pod. Uh, that's the, the, the maximum parallelism that I authorized for this. We have, of course, my listeners for the, the Kafka events, but the, the, the treatment themselves, the processing uh, itself is RDF, RDFI split is what's happening here at this point. So here it doesn't consume much resources because it's only looking at the files and depending on of the, the, the merchant banks uh, sending it to the different buckets here. So not many resources involved, so there's only one deployment of this uh, of this process. But here, if I look at RDFI split, here, that's what's happening on the, in this box. So that means um, uh, retrieving the file, splitting it into uh, the different transactions and recreating new files and then sending them to the, to the, the, to the receiving bank buckets. So it consumes uh, some more resources. So here, that's why uh, the serverless functions has automatic automatically be scaled to two deployments because that's what it needs to be able to handle the traffic coming in. Same for the RDFI process. It looks at the files and uh, and uh, process it, adding to the, to the amount of money uh, that uh, all those transactions uh, represent, and then it needs also two of those parts to, uh, to do the processing. Here, what's happening, we can see that we have reached the maximum number of files that we wanted to generate, so 60. So our create transaction parts have scaled down to zero. Okay, we, uh, of course, that's what we, we, we wanted to do. And then here we have reached also the number of uh, 60 for uh, this uh, the first step of uh, processing, so this RDFI split uh, pod should come uh, should come down to zero uh, in a, in a few seconds. We can see that it's uh, we already are consuming a little bit less uh, memory for those kind of things. So here, that's a, a, a neat way to demonstrate with uh, uh, only using uh, bucket notifications and serverless functions. You can fully automate your data pipelines. It doesn't require, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, application that will orchestrate uh, everything and will take care of everything. Here, it's only a few, uh, a few files, a few configuration files that you put into motion that allows you to, to create very simply this kind of, uh, of pipelines. So, speaking of files, um, I will go back here. Speaking of files, you will have uh, all the code uh, and uh, all the um, all the different uh, uh, configuration files and uh, containers, images, and things like this in this repo. Uh, I will also put it in a few days uh, a full uh, a full walkthrough to be able to reproduce this kind uh, of demo. And of course, feel free to to reach out. Uh, for some more information, or if you have questions or, or problems implementing those kind of things, it will be uh, it will be a pleasure to uh, to, uh, to reply to those uh, to those questions. And now I think we still have time for uh, for a few questions. 
absolutely. Um, let's see if we have, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I think we're all kind of um, totally loving the demo that you gave, Guillaume. So I'll open it up and see if people have any questions. And oh, I'm not seeing anything, which means you did a really thorough presentation. So thank you uh, very much. The repo um, that you point out here on the demo page, that has everything in it to reproduce this demo? Yes, there is everything. There is uh, the, the container code to, to be able to create your, the, the, the pods that will process or create the transactions. There is the, the Kafka topic creations. There is, uh, there, well, there is everything to be able to go from scratch that is starting on a brand new OpenShift installation and install everything that you need. Awesome. So um, we look forward to other people t taking this for a test run and trying and demoing it. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Guillaume, and look forward to having you back for um, update, new updates on this topic. So thanks again. And um, if everybody would like to rewatch this, there will be, it will be uploaded on the YouTube channel later today. And I'll steal the slides from Guillaume shortly and um, also link them up there as well and put a blog post with some other resources up on blog.openshift.com. Um, so look for that in the next coming days and we will continue to provide you with entertaining and educational uh, briefings over the coming weeks to take uh, place of some of the conferences that have been canceled. So look for that on the events page at um, open, uh, commons.openshift.org. So take care everybody and thank you very much.